Happy Friday, Goats of the Valley. My name is Griffin. Joining me today is... Landon. That was so unenthusiastic. I Can I, I get... want to say my name as an... <laughs> enthusiastically. Can I say your name enthusiastically? You can say my name enthusiastically. Landon! There you go, folks. All right, cool. He's more excited about my name than I am. I... <laughs> All right, uh, well, welcome, guys, to the Command Valley. Uh, we have an exciting podcast episode for you today. We're going to be talking about the Ikoria Commander products that are going to be releasing along with Ikoria. So technically, Commander 2020, but they're not calling it that. Um, what are they going to call it? Do we have the official name for we don't. what it's going to be called? They haven't released anything about... They'll probably just call it Commander 20. Yeah, like Commander... Or, or... Anyways, that's... <laughs> okay. they, they might. Um, so... Before we begin going into the topic, I just wanted to remind you guys to please like this video, subscribe, leave a comment in the sections below. We really appreciate it. It helps support us as content creators and and we really appreciate it. Also, I just wanted to remind everybody that the newest episode of Duel of the Peaks is out right now. Go ahead and click in the links in the show notes below or the link on the video right now to go ahead and watch the newest gameplay video from our series. So let's jump right into it. So today we're going to be talking about the Ikoria Commander product, which may or may not be Commander 20. We don't know. So we're going to talk about what we want from the upcoming pre-cons, what we're a little bit scared of. And at the end of this video, we'll also have our predictions for what the five Commander color identities will be. Yeah, so like Griffin said, we're going to be getting uh, five new Commander pre-con pre-constructed decks alongside being released alongside of the Ikoria standard set. We're not sure, actually we kind of are sure. We will be getting cards that are going to be in the Ikoria decks that will be in standard and vice versa, but we're supposed to be getting over 75 new cards, I believe is what they said. Um, About 20 for each deck, yeah. Yeah, or 15 and or 20. we're also gonna be getting four new legendary creatures per pre-con. So that's a total of 20 new legendary creatures that are coming into the commander market. And that's not even including all the legendary creatures that are going to be included in the Ikoria standard set, so. Uh, that's why we kind of wanted to make this podcast episode and kind of talk about our hopes and our fears and, and what we want and what could go right and what could go wrong. Because with, I mean, this is probably going to be the most legendary creatures injected into the commander meta probably ever at, well, at, at, least at one a really time, long time at, yeah. At, yeah, in a very long time. So there's, like I, like I said, there's a lot that could go wrong and a lot that could go right. And so we're just going to kind of talk about that. Yeah. Just to mention that the predictions for Aquaria will only be for the face commanders of the five decks. Lannan has been researching it a lot and has fleshed out a prediction for the five face color identities for the commanders. Yeah, going off of just the names of the deck themselves. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you guys are going to take a peek into my madness a little bit. It was uh, it was quite That's fun. the point of this. Quite fun the point of this that episode out. right now. Yeah, that'll be at the end, so <laughs> I'll give you you'll, like, have, you'll have to I'll watch you, this. I'll give you a little insight into how I figured this out so it's <laughs> with with my methods and with what i did i was able to accurately predict the four pre-constructed decks for commander 2019 just the color identities and and which deck they were attached to yeah he went four for four so we're hoping that the predictions for choreo will be correct if they are i'll be super excited <laughs> all right so let's go ahead and jump right into it so let's start with what we want from the upcoming pre-cons a lot is riding on these pre-cons in different ways especially with the brawl decks that have just come out recently there's there's a lot riding on the Ikoria precons or core or commander 20 that we're, we're all looking forward to so let me go ahead and start off about the first thing that i want from the upcoming precons the first thing i wanted to talk about is i really want there to be unique commanders that consist of new strategies commanders like Eureka and Feather that create a new deck or a new lane in certain colors that we haven't seen before. Maybe they're not super open for options, like they're pretty specific, like Feather and Eureka. Like Feather is going to be an instant and sorcery that you're getting back into your hand, and the Eureka is just a ninja deck. And those are pretty much similar no matter where you go. But they, when they came out, they added a new avenue into Commander that people hadn't seen before. And there's a lot of cards sitting in collections that suddenly became viable in a deck that got people really excited. So I, I really want to add more strategies into the fold of Commander because we have quite a huge selection of Commanders, but there's still so many more strategies to explore and to add to. Along that same vein of thought, I also hope that we get new Commanders that take piles of like Maybe not necessarily bad cards, but cards that just haven't found homes in decks and kind of give them a home. I would like for there to be more commanders that are put into colors that probably don't have as many 
uh, commander options or perhaps the options that they have are either slim or like not super viable like or like and like uh, we talked about how feather was the first in a long time of like a Boros commander that didn't care about turning everything sideways every single turn. And I mean, in a feather deck, you are wanting to turn feather sideways, but like that's just commander, you know, you need to reduce your opponent's life totals to zero, but we want to see, we want to see commanders in color pairings that n not necessarily go ag against the color pairings, but like maybe focus on like in a white blue deck, um, focusing less on the aspect of white stacks and maybe more blue card value. You know, just kind of like maybe give like shifting focus a little bit and opening up, like you said earlier, new avenues for new decks. Mm -hmm. Some of the best examples for these decks, along with Eureka and Feather, coming out in Dominaria was Moldrotha. And actually, right now on EDH Rec, Moldrotha is the most popular commander to be built in the past two years. And the reason I believe that Moldrotha was so exciting is because she added a completely new strategy and a completely new deck to the format. And commanders that are not necessarily so popular, I mean, let's just look at Theros. I know Theros was not specifically a commander-themed deck, but we had a couple of commanders that were added in that didn't really blow up just because those strategies had already been created in other commanders. We look at cards like Athreos, which is a Orzov aristocrat style deck, but we already have so many other options for aristocrats. We have Nylea, which is a super exciting deck, but there's so many other options for green where you can have card draw or mana ramp on it. And then even though Erebos was pretty exciting, um, there is so many other options to be able to play in aristocrats as well, strategy that lets you draw cards and gain advantage off of it. Now I'm not saying these commanders are bad, but the reason why I'm not super excited for them are because they, they add to an avenue that's already been opened and there's already somebody at the top that's leading it. One thing that we probably should have mentioned at the beginning of the video is these are just our very subjective opinions and we're not claiming to be, you know, the, like the perfect commander players and we know the format better than everybody else. These are just our opinions and like how we've come to love and know commander. Um, so when we, we're saying these things, we're not trying to sound, you know, pretentious or, or anything like that. We're just trying Opening to, a conversation. Oh, yeah, have, just having the conversation and, and just kind of exploring what could be possible. So that's like kind of a little interjection, but <clears throat> another thing to note is not always the most like powerful commander that's released um, or, or th on the appearance, the most powerful legendary creature. Oftentimes that's not the most popular. Like for example, Prime Speaker Vanifar. I remember when that card came out during, uh, was it Ravnica Allegiance? Yeah, Ravnica Allegiance. Um, people were losing their minds over Prime Speaker Vanifar with people even uh, proposing preemptive bans. Mm -hmm. Like they should, they should ban certain cards or they should just ban Vanifar right out of the gate. Turns out like, I never even played against the Vanifar deck at my at our fairly large local game store, and I had built a Prime Speaker Vanifar deck, and it wasn't it wasn't like top tier CDH, but like it was a very powerful deck. I ended up dismantling it because it just wasn't fun. It was the same game every single time. You go up the same ladder, you have the same interactions every single game, and after doing that three times, I was bored of it. And so I think that kind of harkens back to what we were saying earlier is we don't want super linear decks that play the same every single game. We want decks that open up new strategies that make every single game a little bit different and a little bit more exciting. I just wanted to add that this is my personal take. I would love for or I would love for the upcoming precons to contain um, more two color commanders. A lot of two color pairings have so much so much more that could be put into them, especially with again new strategies and new avenues especially coming off of Guild of Ravnica and Ravnica Allegiance, I personally was left a little bit underwhelmed by the amount of two color commanders that had come out, but just didn't call out to me. Now we did get some exciting ones. Tasia was obviously the most popular in there, but what I would love for Ikoria to open up is to add, you know, even if it's just five to 10, five to 10 two color pairings into the format that excite a lot of people. In the past couple of years, we've gotten a lot of three color decks to open up new avenues. But I think if they trail it back a little bit and create more two color decks that people can get excited over because they're much easier to build and much easier to add to. They're a little bit more strict, a little bit easier for new players. I think that would be a wise move to do. Something that I would like to see this year, I don't know that they'll do it, but I'd be super excited, would be to see a cycle of monocolored commanders with the mechanic partner. So you can have, you can kind of mix, mix and match them I think that would be super cool. I think the problem with the two color partner commanders is it just kind of homogenized a couple of strategies to where 
I, I don't know, I'm not gonna say that it necessarily killed the decks, but it kind of killed some uh, brewing because it just makes more sense to play these certain two color commander pairings. But I think monocolored are, are probably pretty safe and I, I would enjoy seeing that. But so kind of moving on from, uh, from a deck building perspective or like the types of commanders that we would like to see, something that I would enjoy and hope and maybe other people would like to see this too is i would like to see that too you'd like to hear it and read it too because what i'm saying is the story whoa <laughs> i would like to I, I would i would be super happy if they put a little bit more effort into like the lore and the story behind the new commanders that are coming out and maybe with this pre-con these pre-cons being released with akoria we could get it like maybe some of these legendary creatures are featured in the story of Ikoria, but maybe were too powerful to be printed in the standard. And maybe like like the stories could could intermingle because in past precons, sometimes we're left with nothing from for the legendary creature. And it's a little unfortunate because I know that a lot of a lot of people get into Commander for the story and for the lore, and that's kind of what captivates people and, and keeps them playing is is the story. And I think it's kind of a shame that a lot of the commanders don't get anything and it would be super cool to, to have a little bit more information on them. I definitely know in my case, I I definitely know in my case, one of the, the best things about magic is the story and the effort that they put into the story, especially with the recent upset of Theros where the story was extremely disappointing. They really need to be back on track with putting as much effort into the story as they can. And I think releasing a story along with Ikoria that represents the pre-cons that gets people excited for the story of the pre-cons as well. That would be an amazing idea. And I really hope that Wizards either looks into it or is already gonna do it for this set. So the next thing I wanted to talk about, and this kind of goes along with the, the the flavor and the story that we were talking about. I, I would like for the pre-cons and the set itself to have cards that you could probably interchange. And what I mean by that is you have the pre-cons and people pick up the pre-cons and there's a strategy to it. And they open up packs from Ikoria itself and open up cards that aren't in the deck, but they're like, oh my gosh, that could go really well in this deck. And I, I would like to put this in this deck. Like either if it's like mythic, if it's mythic rare cards or rare cards or even just commons and uncommons, if a player can open up a pack and see something that he's excited for, for the pre-con he just got, I think that would be a win-win situation for both wizards and the players. I'm also hoping for that as well. I think, I'm also hoping that, or the way that they could implement that is if each of the five decks are focusing on a strategy, which they always do, or a specific mechanic, hopefully that mechanic shows up in the standard set as well. Like for example, if we take what was one of the new mechanics from Ravnica Afterlife for the white, white, black, right? The Orzov. If we would have gotten the precons in Ravnica, it would have been super cool if one of the precon decks had the Afterlife mechanic as well as in standard. And you could just like kind of interchange some of the cards or open up those cards in the booster packs and slide them right into your deck. I think that'd be, I would excite a lot of new players. And that would also incentivize people for buying booster packs or drafting because they have they have the chance of not only, you know, having fun drafting, but also possibly opening up cards that they could slide right into their commander deck. Absolutely. I think that'd be a win-win. It helps the commander players get in on the excitement modern players have, because modern players come into the standard sets and look for things that go into their modern decks. And commander decks, like new commander players, don't have really an avenue to do that yet. So if wizards can put cards, like Lan and I were saying, that benefit the strategy of the pre-cons, then yeah, that's gonna excite a lot of people. That's gonna get people to, to draft. It's gonna get people to buy booster packs. And it's also gonna get people from the drafts and standard sets to buy pre-cons and get into Commander. Yeah, and not everybody has the mind or the desire to to, to spend a lot of time on on a, sites like EDH Rec or other, other sites looking for ways to improve their deck. Sometimes they just wanna open cards and and experiment with those you know they and i think that would be a super good way again to get people to to draft or to buy packs too which i think it's always better to buy singles but that's when you're like intentionally building a deck and you have like a goal in mind but if you're just looking for quick ways to upgrade the deck yeah that's that'd be super cool so the last thing that i want to mention in our hopes and dreams and what we want in the pre-cons and this topic comes up every single year for the pre-cons and that is the value and the reprints in this set and for c19 especially coming from c18 there was a lot of discussion about how disappointing the reprints were for c18 and the the 
and the boat went upwards a little bit for C19, but it wasn't nearly where we wanted it to be. It wasn't what we were promised. No. <laughs> I think that was the issue is we were, our hopes were, were driven up because we were assured that it was, we were reassured that C19 would have better reprints and more value, and it ended up that not being the case. Think about um, it this way. The most expensive reprint in the pre-cons is less expensive than five of the new cards from the pre-cons. So much so that the five new cards already need reprints. Yeah, like Dark Side Extortionist. Dark Side Extortionist, Crick, um, Sudden Substitution. So for uh, the, the pre-cons in Ikoria, and we talked about this for C19 as well, something that I really, really want and Lennon can also bounce off this too for new cards, but I really want them to print more lands that are efficient into the pre-cons. So I, I kind of have some fears when it comes to how much money uh, each of these uh, commander decks are going to have in them. When I say money, like how how many expensive reprints are going to be in there. That And that's only the case for this year in particular because I, we were talking with our local game store owner and he let us know that the supply this year is, is incredibly limited. In fact, our, our local game store is only getting eight of each. And if each of those decks, you know, have twice as much value as it costs to buy the deck, which sometimes is the case, it's going to be super hard to get your hands on these decks. So that I, maybe we should cover that a little bit later and, and what we're worried about. But that is something that's at the back of my mind that I, I am a little worried about. But I, I don't see why they can't print fetch lands that the fetch lands themselves enter the battlefield tapped unless you have two or more opponents and they still function like a normal fetch land you pay one life and sacrifice them or maybe you don't have to pay any life that kind of seems arbitrary in commander but you sacrifice them go and find the either or for whatever fetch land it is and that enters the battlefield untapped and we're I'm, i'll i'll say that not every single deck needs fetch lands if you're playing two colors you really i don't see a reason why you need fetch lands in fact uh after doing some research just on mana bases there are a lot of two color pairings that have uh, a lot more limited resources when it comes to lands enter play untapped. Like, is it doesn't have a whole lot of possibilities for dual lands enter the battlefield untapped. So I think before we get um, fetch lands that only work in commander, I would like to see just more lands that enter untapped or have the possibility of doing so in colors that don't already have them. Because if you're not playing three, and even with three colors, you can get by without having fetch lands. Um, if let's say you put 10 in your deck, which 10 would be extreme. I don't see why you would put 10 in your deck, but let's say you put five in your deck and you're running 35 lands. That's a very small portion of your deck. Um, so I don't think that it makes a super huge difference, but again, um, I, I think it would be cool. It would be nice of them to do that. Like it would be throwing the commander players a bone. And I think that if they were cheap and they were super accessible, maybe, th maybe they would be played more. I don't know. It's I agree. I love I love <coughs> Lennon's idea here for one of the most expensive thing in Commander is always going to be the lands because lands yeah, just uh, lands are produced for every single format. I mean, shock lands and fetch lands and dual lands, they're all so expensive because of their use in every single format. So if we can add lands that are specific to Commander players that specifically talk about how many opponents you have, just like the Battle Bond lands, I think that would be a genius move. It would help out Commander players. It would help decks, specifically the Precons, which have always struggled with the mana base to really be pushed into the realm of what, what we're searching for as Commander players. I think this is a kind of a good segue into our fears uh, for Which there Commander are many. 20. Yeah, well, and I kind of already mentioned it. It was number one accessibility and kind of like the, I don't want these, I don't want to pay 80 bucks for one of these pre-cons. Like, you know, it, it just doesn't sound appealing to me. But I also want there to be you know, some value in there. I don't want to pay $40 for a pile of cards that aren't worth $40. Like if I can purchase the whole deck card for card for less than $40, I would feel pretty bad. Oh, anybody um, would. That would be just ridiculous. I don't, don't think we've ever had that. Have it be that yeah. bad. But like a good example from C19 is they were putting the lockets in the decks instead of the signets. And to me, that seemed like super stupid because a, the lockets had just been, they had just been created, right? They had just been created like that year in the Ra the Ravnica sets. And they are good. They, no one plays the lockets. I mean, paying three mana for, for a mana rock, that's, that's a little bit of a steep price. 
and like the signets aren't even that expensive. Like that wasn't, I wasn't like, people weren't even complaining about the signets not being in there on a value perspective. It's on a deck building perspective. Like they're kind of teaching new players that, you know, three mana mana rocks are super good. Well, and maybe that's not what they were trying to say, and, and but it, like- They do draw you cards as well. So I think wizards are trying to, um, satisfy both bases is like hey here's mana ramp and here's card draw so we can fit more cards into it that's possible um but yeah i agree with landon i, I don't want there to be dud cards and like a lot of dud cards obviously going to have some dud cards but in well like commander staples right like every deck is running signets that can run them every deck is running like they were playing our millery sphere which is a super lame mana rock that or it's not even a mana rock sorry it's an artifact that can it doesn't even put lands into play it just puts them into your hand and from my experience, that's just, that's like mana fixing. That's not really mana ramp. Like, mm -hmm. You'd rather be ramping than fixing, especially in like in a two color deck where getting both of your colors should be super easy unless you kept a really sketchy hand. So, so I guess my fear is I'm afraid that they either will be poorly constructed or sometimes we know wizards, how they like their power creep and sometimes things sneak past play design that shouldn't have snuck past and we get an Oko in one of the pre-cons and it drives <laughs> the price of the deck up a bajillion dollars. But And then they don't make a, they don't restock it. So now all of those eight that you just had at the game store sell out and no one yeah, yeah. can get them. Well, like, like I was saying earlier, our game store is only getting eight of each. So that's um, 40, 40 decks. And we don't know if they're going to restock. I assume they will, but. Well, it's like with the, like, and that's what happened with the Brawl pre-cons or the Brawl decks mm -hmm. is um, super limited supply. In fact, I think our game store only got five each. And um, so the price, I, I've purchased two of the Brawl decks and I paid $22 each. At that time when they were, they were released, I think people were paying upwards of 60. Yeah, they sixty game stores that I called, it was about 40 to 65 was kind of the range. Which is ridiculous for Absolutely. 60 cards. Um, and, and enough people complained or I don't know if enough people complained or wizards just realized that they needed to print more and they printed more and it, it drove the cost down. But I purchased, I think they put them back on the shelves like two months ago. So yeah, people had to wait did. a couple months. But the, the, the thing that I saw with the brawl decks is that the excitement of the brawl decks dropped off by the time they were stocked at the second time, because they took so long to do that. The excitement dropped down. And I think what's going to happen with the pre-cons, if they really want to make product for commander players, and specifically for new commander players, they will print more right off the bat. Because what's going to happen is that the stores are going to get these eight of each. They're going to sell out immediately because collectors are looking for these, these products so they can resell it on the market. Or as a long-term investment. Or as a long-term investment. And the new players aren't going to be able to access them. And by the time that they restock it, the excitement of it is already gone and you're losing. I'm going to say you're going to be losing upwards of half of the momentum that you're getting from these pre-con decks for new players. If that's the case, because that's what happened with the brawl decks. I, even for me, I was super excited about the brawl decks, but the fact that I, for a whole month and a half, I didn't have access to them really drove the idea of getting my own. I wasn't going to pay $60 for the brawl deck because well, I, I, I was, I was just looking at it for the commander and I wasn't going to pay $60 for one card. Oh, and I guess arc, arcane signet, but the next fear that I kind of have is as far as printing new commanders that open up new avenues, <laughs> I guess we're, we're being, we're being super picky, I, I suppose, but, um, we don't want them to be too strong, right? We don't want them to be printing commanders that we don't want more Leovolds. Like mm -hmm. I am pretty. When it comes to banning things, like I, I don't think that they should be banning things, but I don't also want them to make commanders that aren't fun for people or are so busted that um, the commander gets super expensive. But also earlier we said that the super busted commanders don't always necessarily become the most popular mm -hmm. because commander players, since there is no competitive league for commander, um, people aren't playing for money. A lot of people aren't really interesting, interested in playing uh, the most powerful commander but we don't want that commander to exist anyway. Just because people aren't gonna play it because they're not interested in it, I still don't want it to exist in the first right, place. I don't, I don't want that option to be there. Um, so that's one of the fears is busted things. On the reverse, one of my fears is that the commanders that are gonna be released are mediocre in the same strategies in the same colors that we've seen. One of the things I fear the most is wizards releasing a commander or commanders in the product itself that do the same thing as another commander could do, but worse in the same colors that we haven't seen before. If we look back at C19, 
One of the reasons that Wizards got a pass and, and people seem to like the product is because even though the strategies were pretty similar to things we've seen before, they were in different colors. Like for instance, we had Savine and specifically Elsha, which really cared about spell slinging. And it reminded us a lot about Kess. And one of the biggest differences between the two is that one of them is Jeskai and one of them is Grixis. Now they both do different things, but their strategy gears towards the same area. Now, if we look at it in a different way, what if Elsha was Grixis? then all of a sudden that card doesn't become as relevant because it's the same strategy gearing towards the same place in the same colors. And I do fear that Wizards sometimes have a, has a tough time of doing this. Gurid especially was a, just another popular commander that was worse than the ones that we've seen. And they, they added red to Gurid simply just to, to spice it up, add a little bit more to it, even though there wasn't really a lot to it anyway. They did get a pass because they added red to it. Now, on the reverse, if well, Grid people was... People maybe want to populate dragons, you know? like <laughs> well, That's true. Again, there was a couple of things in there that were yeah. exciting, like Nesting Dragon. Um, but I I fear that one slip up by just making Gurid green and white would have been a complete disaster for the commander deck because it's not a good commander for populate. And the only reason that it's viable is because it adds another color to it. Mm -hmm. So what I want Wizards to not do is to bring in the same colors with the same strategies with decks that are, are already in the format that just do it better. So so basically the exact inverse of what our hope is to, I mean, but it, it needs to be said because it's a good point, so. The last thing I wanted to talk about before we got on to the predictions is the specific color pairings that I don't want in the pre cons for Aquaria. And the only colors that I do not want are four and five color commanders. Like Lennon was alluding to earlier, when you have colors, when you have that many colors, sometimes it doesn't even matter what the strategy is. It just, there's too much into the colors. There's too much that you can choose from. It's not friendly to new players. They're hard to build. You have to be a really good deck builder to be able to make these efficiently because new players might be too scared to pick up these decks because it just doesn't make sense to them. So that's why I really want wizards to keep down to two, maybe three color decks that are specific, that are easy to build, they're easy to format, and people can upgrade the decks themselves without having too much, without needing too much knowledge of the format. But after all that, that's our hopes and fears for Ikoria and the pre-cons. So the moment that you've all been waiting for, I'm gonna leave this to Lennon for him to talk about his Ikoria predictions. So Wizards um, decided to give us the five names for the five pre-cons. Um, and uh, I probably spent a little bit more time than I should have evaluating those names. Um, so just giving you quite simply, and we can we can do a video on how I did this if you guys want. But briefly put, I took the five names, I went on EDH rec, I found all the two and three color pairings. For each of the two and three color pairings, I counted all of the possible commanders for each of those, and how many of each of the color pairings have received their own dedicated precon. Um, I then decided that Wizards of the Coast was going to prioritize the underrepresented color pairings before they printed a precon for a color that already has had several dedicated precons. After I'd gotten those numbers, it was just a matter of matching the names to what they sounded like for colors. The five names are Ruthless Regiment, Arcane Maelstrom, Symbiotic Swarm, Timeless Wisdom, and Enhanced Evolution. And some of these seem like a little bit more obvious than others, but here are my predictions. So Ruthless Regiment, I'm predicting is going to be a Boros colored precon, so red-white. Arcane Maelstrom, which this one is a little bit difficult. My initial pick is Demir, so a blue-black deck, but it could also be Teemer, but I, I am locking in Demir. Um, and then the Symbiotic Swarm, I'm locking in at Abzan, so green, white, black. And Timeless Wisdom, I'm locking in at White Blue, so Azorius. And Enhanced Evolution, I'm locking in at Teemer. Um, but that could also be Simic. But like I said, I'm 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 gonna definitively say Teemer. But the the Enhanced Evolution and the RK Maelstrom are the ones I am the least confident about. But we'll see. C19 was a little bit easier to predict because they gave us the mechanics of the deck. And oftentimes mechanics are a little bit more indicative of color identity than the names alone. So, so going through it again, Ruthless Regiment is going to be Boros, according to Landon. Arcane Maelstrom is going to be Demir, according to Landon. Symbiotic Swarm is going to be Abzan. Timeless Wisdom is Zorius. And Enhanced Evolution is going to be Teemer. One of the standards that I held myself to is each of the colors will be represented at least twice. 
and one color is going to be represented three times. So I have blue being represented three times and Timur, Azorius, and Demir and then all the other colors are represented twice. All right, I think that's about it. So if, <clears throat> so when Akoria releases and you have the pre-cons, you know the colors, you heard it here first. With that, that's all we have to talk about today, guys. Thanks so much for listening to the end of this video. I hope you guys enjoy. Please like, subscribe, comment in the sections below what you think the Ikoria colors are going to be, what you hope for, what you're scared of, and overall what your takes are gonna be for the pre-cons in Ikoria. One last time, if you guys haven't already subscribed, please make sure to do so. It's a quick, easy way to support the channel, and we really appreciate the support. And leave a comment down below on maybe future topics that we could cover in these podcast episodes. We'd be more than happy to cover those too. So, All right. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you guys next time.